The Lord be with you. God's law comes to us from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. But as for you, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please join me in singing from a Presbyterian hymnal, number 122, Thine is the Glory.
please be seated. Lord, you have made a covenant of grace with a poor man, a covenant which says, I will put my law within them. So now, Lord, seeing that Jesus Christ has founded this covenant in his blood, and I am one of those for whom he made satisfaction, write your law in my inward parts, that I may do all your will. Amen. Receive these words of comfort from God. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please share a sign of Christian love with your neighbors. Church, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from him from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through Jesus, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God.
please join me in prayer. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel. According to all that he promised, not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his rules, which he commanded our fathers. Amen. You may be seated.
Man, thank you, choir. Always love those, uh, the minor tunes. All right, we now enter into a portion of our service. We lift up prayers for our families, for our friends, for the church, and for the world. You see the prayer request printed in your bulletin. I had a couple that were sent to me this morning. Um, so if you could please keep um, Alice Bond in your prayers. Um, I believe she is at uh, First Baptist Church, the parish nurse there. She fell and broke her hip and I think is having surgery um, sometime soon. Um, so Alice Bond, keep her in your prayers. Um, and then prayers for Ben Hedgepeth, who had a motorcycle accident uh, recently. So I don't know any other details other than that. So uh, keep him and, and the family in your prayers. Um, are there any other prayer requests to lift up this morning? Yes, Teddy? We're going to pray for Kelsey in Burundi and her family. Thank you, Teddy. Yes, Mark. We'll certainly keep the family of Joey Merricks in our prayers um, and the fire departments. No, thank you, Mark. Yes, Betsy. We'll pray for Clarissa Putman. Thank you. Yes, Anne. And for we'll certainly keep the Tucker family in our prayers. Thank you. Yes, Darlene. Sure. So we'll pray that that infection clears and uh, we know that God has a path laid out before him. So we'll keep him in our prayers and um, the family. So thank you, Darlene. Yes, Stephanie. Absolutely. So we'll keep Kathy Stone in our prayers, um, cancer and pain. Yes, Jean. And keep Al and Jeannie in our prayers. Haven't seen them in a while, so we'll just keep them in our prayers. Thank you. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Cynthia. So we'll keep the community of Allen, Texas in our prayers um, as they face this grief. And we always keep our country, our leaders, our people in our prayers. So thank you, Cynthia. Any other prayer requests? All right. Well, hearing none, then let us bring these prayers to the Lord. 
Heavenly Father, first of all, we, we want to praise you. We want to praise and adore your name for your perfect plan that you have for the world. Very often, we don't see the plan out playing out. We obviously don't know uh, every detail of that plan, but we know that you have a plan, that you have been working things out in eternity past and into eternity future. So God, we thank you for that. We praise your name. We, we magnify your um, omniscience that uh, you do see and know all things. And so God, we know that your plan is also perfect. So God, we thank you for that. We praise your name that um, uh, as the Apostle Paul reminds us, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. That's part of your plan. And so God, I pray that you help us to confess our sins when, when there is contention within our hearts or within our, our families, within our homes, within our communities. Usually this contention uh, can come because we, we either forget about your plan uh, or we confuse your plan with our own. So God, I pray that you, you help us. Help us to repent, to turn, and, and to trust, to obey, to look at you and, and to look toward you and to look for you trusting in, in what you have worked out in our past and what you have aligned for our future, that we may line ourselves with you. We thank you, of course, for sending Christ Jesus to bring peace, uh, bring the peace between our warring thoughts, between ourselves, certainly our warring thoughts between you and us. And God, we thank you so much for the Prince of Peace, whose peace passes all understanding, that in him, we can follow the path that is laid before us. In him, we can understand uh, to some measure, to some degree, the plan that you have placed before us. And the, the part of that plan that we know for sure in all clarity is that we come to you through him. So we thank you so much for providing that gate, providing that way, the path to salvation. And so, Lord, we want to intercede on behalf of those who um, may not know that, may not see that, may not fully trust that you are the gate, that you are the path, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, I pray that you convict us where we fall short in that and that you surround us with brothers and sisters to help us to see that, to understand that, to live into that. May you help us to be the, the hands and feet of that same truth in this world, that we can uh, show folks to Christ by showing them Christ in us, Christ in our own lives. God, I pray that you help us to be your disciples wherever you've called us to be. Lord, of course, we pray all of this in the name of Christ, who is our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Teddy, I got a short story I want to read with you. All right. We're going to read a story about some friends who brought another friend to Jesus. Yes, you can hold the bookmark. All right. So Jesus was teaching in a house. A crowd of people filled the house to hear him. Then four friends came carrying a man. And this man could not move. The crowd is too big, the four men said. So they took the man on his mat up onto the roof. Now, why do you think they would go to the roof? Yes. So the four men made a hole in the roof, and they lowered their friend down into the house right in front of Jesus. And Jesus saw that the four men had great faith. Your sins are forgiven, Jesus told the man on the mat. Now the teachers of the law were saying to themselves, Who does Jesus think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what the teachers were thinking. He asked them, Is it easier to forgive sins or say, Rise and walk? My son is weak and I That's Jesus. 
And so Jesus told the man on the mat to stand up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man jumped up, he picked up his mat, and he walked out of the house praising God. Everyone was amazed that Jesus had healed the man on the mat inside and out. So it's awesome when we are able to have friends who, who help us understand and lead us to Jesus. And that's why it's also good to be a good friend to others. Can we pray for that? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus um, not only to uh, heal us of our infirmities, but to forgive us of our sins. We thank you so much for the friends in our lives who have helped us to come to know more and more about Jesus. And I pray that you help us to be like those friends whose faith can help lead others to Jesus, the power that he has to heal and to forgive sins. So God, we thank you for his life and his work and the life of many saints. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Teddy. Well, I just want to highlight one minute for missions this morning. Is uh, Of course, we've got our Koinonia luncheon after church. I hope to see each and every one of you uh, back there. We're going to have some good time of fellowship, uh, celebrating the, um, the wonderful good news of who Jesus is as we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, you see there are others printed in the bulletin, but if there are any others you wish to lift up at this time, uh, please let me know. Yeah, Betsy. Thank you. Message from the stated clerk and my wife. <laughs> yes, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for that update, and I praise God that the, the team was able to go there, and um, I look forward to hearing more of how we can help in the future. So thank you, Ron. Any other announcements? All right, well, seeing none, then let us come to the Word of God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for the perfect plan that you have worked out uh, we thank you for your son, uh, who is the fulfillment of the promises in the Old Testament, and in whom we come before your throne. God, I pray that you help us to understand what it is to be Christians, to be his followers, to be his disciples. And Lord, I pray that as we uh, come before you in word and in deed, that we give you all glory, honor, and praise. We pray all of this in the name of Christ, who is our Savior. Amen. And amen. Well, this morning we are continuing in our uh, topical mini-series on uh, living as Easter Christians. 
uh, the way that we develop or developing godliness in response to the fact of the resurrection. Again, we are in the season of Easter. We just, a few weeks ago, of course, we celebrated Easter. Uh, so what? what? What impact does that have on our lives? How does that change us? How does that reality inform who we are today, sort of post-resurrection or as Easter Christians? Um, this morning, we're going to be reading from Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, uh, chapter 3, verses uh, 12 through 17. So without further ado, let me begin there, and we will uh, see what God has said for us. So again, Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the, Paul's epistle to the Colossians echoes a lot of the same themes that you find in his epistle to Galatians, which, of course, was uh, the subject of last week's sermon. Um, chapter 3 in the book of Colossians, you see a lot of similarities. You do see a lot of echoes, uh, specifically, as we talked last week, about Paul's distinctions between the flesh and the spirit, the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. So there, you're going to hear some similar themes going on, but there are some differences, and that's what I'm going to highlight this morning. While the Galatians, his letter to the Galatians, specifically that section, dealt with the subject of Christian liberty. Um, so again, we're, we're freed from sin, but not free to sin. And so that's why he's, Paul delineates between the flesh, the deeds of the flesh, and the fruit of the Spirit. We are freed from sin, but not freed to sin. Um, Colossians, on the other hand, deals with the subject of Christian identity. So we've got Christian liberty in Galatians, Christian identity in Colossians. Let me just read to you just the first three verses of uh, chapter 3 just for context. Um, if then you have been raised with Christ, so there Paul is making an assumption or, or a presupposition. If then you have been raised in Christ, if that's a true statement, if you are indeed resurrected with Jesus, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. So there you see that distinction. You know, earlier in Galatians, the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Here he says, set your mind on the things that are above, the fruit of the Spirit almost, and not on the things that are of the earth, which are, you know, the deeds of the flesh, the fleshly things. Verse 3, for you have died... And your life is hidden with Christ Jesus. So the reason we do not set our minds on the, the flesh, not our, the things of the earth, it's because, verse 3, we have died with Jesus. So that is a fact of Easter Sunday. If we are a Christian, if we are regenerated, if we are born again, whatever language you want to use, if we are uh, covered in Christ and Christ is in us, then we have died with him our sins, not just our sins, but our old self has died with him. So I praise God that our sins have been crucified with Jesus, that no longer are we guilty before that awful throne of God. No longer will he look at us in condemnation, but he looks at us uh, with mercy. But not only is that true, not only are our sins crucified with Christ, our old self has been crucified with Christ, which again is why Paul says, we are freed from sin, but not free to sin. Of course, Paul didn't say that, but that's the, the idea in Galatians chapter 5. He again is saying something similar here, but again, not speaking about liberty, but specifically about identity. 
So not only have our sins been crucified with Christ, our old self, the old way that we have identified ourselves, our old sense of identity has been crucified with Christ. So because of the resurrection, because of Easter, our new life in Christ means that the old life in the flesh is dead. And that's Paul's language there. For you have died. He uses that language because it's very clear. We all know the finality of death. Every single one of us in this room has experienced it in some form or another, whether it's a parent or a sibling or a child or a friend. We all know the finality of death. We know it. They're not coming back from beyond the grave. There's a finality to it. Paul uses that language for a reason. He doesn't say that our old self is just merely covered. Our old self is not simply washed away. And that, that language is used in baptism. But more explicitly, Paul is saying your old self is dead in Christ. That old way of living, the old deeds of the flesh, the, the sinful nature that is so common to all of us, has been dead, has died with Christ. So this is what Paul is getting at here in Colossians. If that old self is dead, then we live into something new. We live into a new image that is, of course, the image of Christ. Of course, that's the beauty of the resurrection. Just like, again, we know that our friends, our family who, who, have, who have died and passed on, we know we will never see them in this life, but we know that we will see them in the next. So there is that promise of the resurrection. Well, likewise, our old self, the old sinning ways have died and a new self, a new identity has been prepared for us on the cross. Paul, of course, will list very similar vices to the deeds of the flesh in verses 5 through 9, which is why uh, we're starting at verse 12. And so for time's sake, we're going to focus on where he says, again in verse 3, to set our minds on the things from above. So what are the things from above? Well, we see them here in verses 12 through 17. So in verse 12, he introduces uh, uh, five uh, virtues, if you will, five things from above. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, this is not the only list. Uh, there are nine through the Spirit. Well, here there are only five uh, things from above, so to speak. Well, we know that that's not, again, a limited number. Paul is using these for our benefit. So as chosen ones, that's the way he starts out this verse 12. Um, since, you know, so as those who have been chosen of God, um, as the elect, as those who are appointed by God for salvation. So he's, again, assuming that we have been called by God, that the people of God are his chosen ones, that the people of God have the, are the ones whom he has appointed throughout the ages for salvation. Those of us who are those, the, the elect, the chosen ones, he says, that is your identity. Okay? We are chosen ones of God. If we are in Christ, we are those appointed for salvation. That is our new identity. No longer the, the way, you know, the things of the earth, the deeds of the flesh, that earthly way of thinking. That is not our identity. Your sin is not your identity. Your Enneagram number is not your identity. Your heart is not your identity. Your dreams are not your identity. Your vocation is not your identity. Your station in life is not your identity. If you are a Christian, your identity is in Christ as chosen ones of God. That's what Paul is trying to drive home, especially to the church in Colossae where there is division and unnecessary distinction. If we are in Christ, if we have been called and chosen, elected by God, then that is our identity. And he modifies this election. And when I mean modifies, I'm speaking grammatically speaking here. 
He says again that uh, this uh, uh, chosenness of God, having been chosen of God, he modifies it by being called holy and beloved. Holy and beloved. So those who are elect, those who are called of God, they are set apart. That's that word holy. I've talked about it numerous times. It's something being unique. It's something being called out of common, out of the vulgar, out of the profane, and brought and set apart for something unique, something special, something sacred. Our election is out of the world and into the body of Christ. And related to that is beloved. So God loves his elect. God loves his children. God loves his chosen ones. They are well-pleasing in his eyes. They are beautiful. They are magnificent. They, they follow after him. And notice that these are realities. These aren't aspirations. Notice that, that the language here isn't saying that we hope to be holy or beloved. No, he says, as those who have been called. There's a certainty of there. Just as you have been called of God, holy and beloved. This is a fact. This is a reality. If you are in Christ, this is your identity. You're chosen, holy, and beloved. And his point, now live that way. Live in reflecting the reality of heaven. That's why he said earlier, set your mind on things above and not on things above. Of the earth. There's a, a saying out there that, that uh, often says um, some people are, are too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good or something along that, that line. I think that's a bunch of tomfoolery because truly if we are heavenly minded, if we are in Christ and we set our mind on the things of above, then we are out there in the world bringing and doing the most good because Paul says here very clearly that you're to live the reality of what our earthly mind is or excuse me, what our heavenly mind has set itself on. We don't just think on heaven and sit in our lawn chairs expecting for the return. That's what Paul exactly says not to do in the letter to the Thessalonians. He chides them for their laziness, for their idleness, because they think that Jesus is just around the corner and that gives them license to not have to work or do anything. Paul says, no, no, no. You have to get to work. You have to be industrious. We have to live the life that has been purchased for us on the cross. And so Paul says here is put on the heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We're going to talk about those in a minute. But first I want to focus in on this word put on. He says to put on your true self in imitation of Christ. That's your true identity. Again, not your sin, not your uh, whatever, you know, Enneagram or whatever else you want to you think you might, personality test or your um, horoscope or whatever, not your heart, not your dreams, not your vocation, not your station. Christ, put that on. Put your true self on. And, of course, that's Jesus, Christ Jesus. That language, putting on, is the idea of, of sinking into a, a heavy garment. Um, maybe I should have unbuttoned. Because when you put on that heavy winter coat, Think about that. That's kind of the image there. You don't just slip it on really quickly. You got you to lumber into that, that heavy coat. You're really putting it on. You, you're, you know, you got to stretch your arms, get your sleeve. Get, that's the idea. That's what this word put on means. It's not just topping on a hat. No, it is taking on and conforming yourself to this jacket, to this garment. You're adjusting yourself to your new clothes. Think about that. You know, when, when you go and you try on clothes at the department, I don't know if people do that anymore. I guess some people do. Uh, nowadays, you just order it online and try it on at home. But you try it on, you to test and see if it fits. And, and sometimes it's not always right. You know, I really don't like trying on clothes at the department store because I, I want to walk around in it. I want to I try it out. I want to see how it fits. I want to see if I, if I can fit into this garment. We do that with our shoes. So that's the idea here. It's we're to put on our true identity in Christ. And here he modifies or describes what it is. Put on the heart of, and again, he lists five, uh, five words that sound very similar to the fruit of the Spirit. So there's compassion. Put on compassion. 
here. This is a word that suggests mercy. That suggests a sense of, of, of pity, a sense of longing, having a sense of, of mercy, compassion. Uh, the, the Hebrew word and the Greek word is, is sort of feeling it in, in, in your gut, that gut feeling, that, that movement where you see someone hurting, where you see someone in pain, where you see someone struggling. And in your heart of hearts, you know that, that you've got to do something. Even if it's just simply saying a small word or, or sitting with that person grieving or, or helping that person in need. That's that idea of compassion, mercy. So put on a heart of compassion. Put on a heart of kindness. This Greek word actually conveys uh, uh, not so much a, a sense of being just kind, being good-natured. The Greek word actually sense, it, it carries this idea of moral integrity or, or a steadfastness, an ethical steadfastness. That's, of course, lined with the, the morals of God. And, of course, if we are following the morality of God, we are indeed kind. We are indeed loving. We are indeed just. So that's this sense of kindness, is this moral integrity. <coughs> humility, put on a heart of humility. This, of course, is very clearly defined as a modest opinion of the self. Having a high view of the self, we call that arrogance. We call that self-righteousness or selfishness. Having that sense when we come to God means we're just setting ourselves up for failure. We're setting ourselves up for embarrassment. But rather, we should be humble before God and humble before others. So put on a heart of humility. Put on a heart of gentleness. This again is a, 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 an idea of having a mildness of disposition, being mild in, 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 your, in your thoughts, being, being mild in the way that we interact with ourselves, with others, with God, having a sense of mildness. Meekness is another word. And then patience having a mindfulness of others, being long-suffering for others. So Christ-like identity, if you want to write down notes, if you want something super applicable, here's something really applicable. Your identity in Christ should be one of mercy, morality, modesty, mildness, and mindfulness. I'll say it again. Your identity in Christ, your new life in Christ, should be one of mercy, morality, modesty, mildness, and mindfulness. Now, if that's not enough, Paul drives the point further. In verse 13, he says, to bear with one another, forgiving each other. So those who are in Christ Paul is going to drive home, and this is a problem that he finds in the church in Colossae, is that there's lacking in forgiveness. How many times do we come to Christian churches and find that they're lacking in forgiveness? You see, beloved, for Christians, forgiveness is not optional. Let me say that for those in the back. Forgiveness is not an option. It is fundamental. And this is Paul's point. Again, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, why? Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. God knows that we get on each other's nerves all the time. And you know the reason why God knows that? Because we're getting on his nerves every day, every time we live into our own sinful identity, not living in the Christ, not trusting in Christ, not submitting to Christ, not reading our Bibles, not living by the word of God. He looks at his children and we're getting on his nerves every single moment that we do what is displeasing in his eyes. So God knows that we get on each other's nerves because I can guarantee and I'll put myself in there, that each and every single one of us is getting on his nerves. We see that reflected in the Old Testament, 
How many times does God have to bear with Israel as they're out there grumbling, complaining? God, we just want to go back to Egypt. It was nice there. Sure, we were slaves, but at least we had food. At least we had a roof over our head. Now you want us to walk around in this wilderness? Oh, God, we just want to do what we want to do. Uh, why have you have to send this, this persecution on us? God, we'll listen. Send another judge. We'll, we'll, we'll submit to him. And then they do it again and again. Oh, oh God, we just, we just want to worship how we want to worship. We want to do what we want to do. Why do we have to go into exile? Why do you have to, to, to punish our kings? Time and time again, the story of the Old Testament is God bearing patiently with his rebellious children. We see examples in the New Testament. I'll just pull out one, the Apostle Peter. That impetuous, excited apostle upon whom God, uh, uh, Christ, lays the, the, the foundation of the church, the one who, who says and, and, and calls and says that God has revealed to you who I am. And yet in the very same passage, that same Matthew chapter 17, uh, I believe Matthew 17, he goes, and he, he goes and turns around and rebukes Jesus. And Jesus has to call him, get thee behind me, Satan. The Apostle Peter constantly re wrestling with perhaps his own identity. And of course, our own sinfulness in this era over and over and over again. Christians are called to bear with one another and to forgive each other. Why? Because we are forgiven by God. Because God bears with us all the time. If we weren't in church, I'd be using some other words right now to make the point clear. God puts up with a lot from us. The very least we should do is help bear with one another. Why? Because our old self, the old self and its arrogance, in his pride, in his self-righteousness, the old self saying he was right and you're always wrong, that person is dead. That person is dead in Christ. In the new self, we are covered by the righteousness of Christ. This can only happen if our own sins, our own trespasses against the holiness of God have been forgiven. If God is willing to forgive us, the very least we should do is be willing to forgive others. Let me give you three very quick Examples from Jesus himself. If for whatever reason you don't believe the Apostle Paul, let me give you some examples from Jesus. Although you should believe Paul anyways. First is Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant. Remember the parable where there's this servant who owes a great debt to his master and he comes and pleads to him and his master says, all right, I'm going to have mercy on you and uh, he forgives his debt. And then that same slave goes on and there's someone else who owes him a small amount of money. And he says, well, I'm going to throw you in the debtor's prison because you can't pay. And the guy's like, well, have mercy on me. And when the master finds out that this servant whom he just forgiven a great amount won't forgive this small amount, you know what the master does to him? He has him beaten and punished for eternity. That's, that's Jesus' idea there. So that's the parable of the unforgiving servant. Of course, Peter, second example, Peter's question on the forgiveness of frequency. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus lays out for us church discipline. And at the end of it, Peter gets the mess. He gets the point. He knows exactly what Jesus is talking about. And so he asks Jesus, well, how many times am I supposed to forgive someone uh, who sins against me? Seven times? You know, seven's a good number. You know, once a day, that's, that's good enough, right, Jesus? No, Peter, 77 times or seven times seven you got to keep forgiving them as long as they are repenting, says the Jesus. And of course, again, the third example from Jesus' prayer, the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6. Love the Lord's Prayer. We all have it memorized. But what about the final two verses that are not actually part of the prayer, but are an addendum to that prayer that Jesus himself adds? He says this. I believe it's verse 10, Matthew chapter 6. God will not forgive an unforgiving person. So if we sit there and we pray the Lord's Prayer every single Sunday, if we say the Lord's Prayer every single day, whenever, how frequently we say it, and yet if we are not forgiving another, God is not 
forgiven you. That's not Pastor Ed. That's not the Apostle Paul. That's Jesus. Go look it up. Matthew chapter 6. It's not me. So the Christ-like identity, if you're taking notes, write this down. Your identity in Christ. Forgiveness, not cleanliness, is close to godliness. So forgiveness is close to godliness. Verse 14. Beyond all of this, Paul's just keep going. Beyond all of that, beyond compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, beyond forgiveness, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Here's Paul's point. We love one another. He's talking, he's writing this letter to Christians in churches. We love one another not because we're all equally attractive. We all know that there are qualities that make that hard. Some people are harder to love than others. But we love one another not because, again, we find each other equally attractive, but because of the same sacrificial love that was shown to you and to me. The sacrificial love shown to we, a ragtag group of unlovable sinners by God himself. If God is willing to look at rebellious lumps of clay running around on the earth that he fashioned and is willing to have mercy on his heart to forgive and love then so should we. This is perfect, not because any of us is perfect. God knows that. It's perfect not because any of us will ever love perfectly. We know we'll never do that. But because, despite our differences, the church has the same desire for God. There is a unity in the body, the body of Christ, the head, of, the head, which of course is Christ, and the body, which is made up of all believers. That is what God loves because that body has the same desire, the same passions for godliness, the same ambition for going into the world. And so here's a third Christ-like identity. Write this down if you're taking notes. His love is in our hearts. We identify as Christ. We reflect Christ because his love is in us, is on us and in our hearts. And this love, I'm going to try and wrap up quickly. This love is is shown in two forms. Verse 15, we have the peace of Christ. In verse 16, we have the word of Christ. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. So here's one element. You know, if you've been curious this whole time, what is an identity of Christ? Well, here's one, the peace of Christ. That's one element of that identity in Christ. This peace of Christ is the source of unity in the body, of course, in the church, to which indeed you were called into one body. So if we want to identify like Christ, we need to have his peace in our hearts because that's the source of unity in our church. It's also the source of gratitude among the body, again, in which you were called in one body and be thankful because of the peace that we experience between God, because of Christ, we should be grateful. We should be grateful that God doesn't look at us and sees us for who we really are, sinners. Or as Jonathan Edwards says, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Rather, by God's grace and kindness and because of who Christ is, we sees us as his children. We should be thankful 
for that. So it's hard to be united without peace. It's hard to be thankful without peace. May the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I wish I had time to just unpack the whole two, rest, you know, two-thirds of that verse, but I don't. I'm only focused on the first part where he says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom. So the source is the second version of identity or, or, or element, excuse me, of identity in Christ is the word of Christ. The word of Christ is the source of his wisdom. The source of his wisdom. If you want to know what Jesus thinks, read the Bible. If you want to know what God thinks, read the Bible. If you want to know what God wants us to know about himself, read the Bible. Because God has revealed himself to us therein. It is a source of wisdom and it is taught to us. Which is why we sit under sound preaching. Which is why we fellowship together, admonish one another to read and study. This is why as iron sharpens iron, so one man does another. As we dive further along into the wisdom and the word of God, it is taught to us. But not only taught it is applied, with all wisdom applied. That's sort of my, my way of summarizing the remaining two-thirds of this verse here. The word of Christ is a source of his wisdom, and it is applied. We, of course, apply it here in worship, but this is not the only place. And if this is the only place that you're applying the word of God, then you should go out there and strive a little harder. Give me a call. We'll talk. We'll have a conversation. We'll set up a reading plan. We'll sit down. We'll go get coffee. Or if you're into a beer, we'll go get a beer. You know, we'll, we will sit down and we will apply this word of God if this hour is the only time of your week that you're doing it. It's hard to know Christ without the word. And it's hard to mimic Christ without the word in our hearts. And so we get to the final verse. Whatever you do in word or deed. That's Paul's long way of saying, everything you do, whatever you do in word or deed, everything you do, do in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Why is it everything? Not 99% of things. Again, I've talked about that before. You know, we, we love to give God 97% of things, but we really want to keep 3% for us. That's my cut. That's my commission. No. Whatever you do, everything you do. Why? Because Christ is our new identity. Our new, full identity. If we are Christians, he is who we see when we look in the mirror, not anything else. In your mind, whether it's at home or among friends, whether it's at work, in worship, during study, in sessions, in committees, in silence, or in public, whatever, wherever, whenever, is to be said or done to reflect our new identity in Christ. And it comes in two forms. One is glorifying Jesus and with thanksgiving on our lips. If what we are saying or doing does not or will not glorify Christ nor give God thanks, don't say it. Don't do it. If it's not going to bring glory to God, if it's not going to be a, a word of thanks to God, don't even think it. Send it away. If what we say or do does not glorify God nor give him thanks, then the problem is, is we're not identifying with Christ. And beloved, this is what it means to do, and this is the final element of practicality, if you wish. Write this down. 
You have to be vigilant. You have to be aware of your own words, of your own actions, of your own thoughts. Or to summarize into a word we studied last week, one of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Self-control. He's not just talking about drunkenness there. He's also talking about our awareness of our own self, of our own pride, of our own sin, how sometimes we, we forget that it's dead and we let it come back. If what we do, if our thoughts, our actions do not glorify Christ or give thanks to God, then we should be quick to repent and we should be quick to forgive. Because the life of Christ is our model. It's our manner for the new life which is purchased with his blood. Recognize that. Honor that. Actualize that. In fact, there's no better, more fitting place to experience the new identity in Christ than here at his table. Why do we call this sometimes, maybe we call it a Eucharist. We don't use that word here liturgically, but you've heard of it as a Eucharist. The word Eucharist is just the Greek word for thanksgiving. This is the feast of thanksgiving. Why are we thankful? What are we thankful for? Well, we're thankful for the death and resurrection of Christ. We are thankful for the forgiveness of God that is showered upon us. And we remind ourselves every time we come to this table of the mercies and compassion and love that God has in our hearts. Church, this is where we're nourished so that we can go forth and have compassion, mercy, and love in our lives, identifying with Christ Jesus. On the night that he was arrested, he gave thanks, and he broke bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. So every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again in glory. Friends, this is the Lord's table prepared before you. Remember the commands of the Apostle Paul. Let us come to the Lord with sincerity, with truth, with faithfulness, and with love, trusting in the work of Christ, submitting our sins before him, confessing our hearts and our lives. Come, the feast is ready.
Let us pray. We give you all thanks, Almighty God, Heavenly Father. We give you thanks for this meal, which is to us a remembrance of your mighty work, of your work on the cross, of our sins crucified with your Son, of our old self nailed, bloodied, and dead with him, buried in that tomb, no longer the same, but raised unto new life, new life in Christ Jesus. God, I pray that as we feast upon this meal, that we are nourished in mind and body and spirit to trust more and more in that new identity that we have in Christ. May we come to him. May we submit to him. May we reflect his glory and our thanksgiving for all of it in every aspect of our life. For whatever we say and do should be bringing you glory and thanksgiving. We pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. I don't have my bulletin, so what's the last hymn? 31. Hymn 31. Uh, stand and uh, let us sing together from Hymns of Grace, number 31. Children of the living God, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make you make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out into this world living the life that Christ has purchased with his blood. Amen and amen.